Hello and welcome everyone to the Failure Incorporated podcast. Um, we talk about games, mostly games, a lot of games. We all are a bunch of nerds here. I'm your host, Fielka Punch. I, you know, I never said this before, but I'm a dev in the games industry. I stream and I uh, content creator. And with me today, I have my co-host, Truexin. Hello. I have Zero98, who's been on the last podcast. Hello. And I have Potatogram. Hi, that's me. <laughs> um, yeah, we're all a bunch of nerds here to talk about our awesome uh, topic today, which we're going to be comparing player experience and story-rich RPGs versus sandbox-style RPG games. So... Let's kick it off. Sin, why don't you start? All right. So <laughs> it doesn't matter necessarily if you're one side over the other. I definitely lean more technically to the open world side just because I do like getting lost with exploring. However, one of the main things, and this is probably the the largest item with any with anything between these things the linear versus non-linear linear being forced to go on to that railroad and have a direct line that's going to draw you from the start to the end versus having this branching path with like open world and how it's up to you basically whenever you decide to progress the main story you may have a million side quests before that point what are your guys' takes um Oh my god, okay, hold on. Before we get into that, I even want to like, I want to back up one second and like it just explain what a sandbox is versus an open world because you can have, you know, these storytellings in both of these games, but just so people know, like a sandbox game, uh, the emphasis is on manipulating the world and an open world game, the emphasis is on existing inside of the world. So I just want to say that because there's a lot of confusion in general what even constitutes like a game like this. And I think there's a lot of overlap and confusion. And getting back to that, um, where we're talking about like games that are on rails, I got to be honest with you, I'm a big fan of a linear story. I, I will say it right now. I like that. That's my preference. Uh, I like being told where to go. <laughs> <laughs> and getting a nice um, idea of kind of like feeling of progression where it feels like it's ingrained in the story. Like a good example of this for me is Mass Effect. Love it. You know, it's like, it's got like this, you get items and level up and you learn things in the game that really constitutes to feeling like your character's evolving with the world. But I know that's not exactly, it's not exactly an open world, but then again, never mind, wait, I'm thinking about it. You can go to a lot of different worlds in that game. Uh, not even to mention the Mako, which fuck the Mako, if you can even remember that thing. Just me? Yeah. I never <laughs> played Mass Effect. I somehow what? managed to skirt around all that. Yeah. Oh, wow. You know, believe it or not, I'm also in that same boat. Mass Effect is what? a game that I missed out on. I didn't, didn't uh, I didn't originally wow. own an Xbox uh, when after that game was. Uh, I had an popular. Xbox, but I wasn't old enough to play it at the time. Okay, yeah. I'm blown away by this. I 100 percent of that game, so I really. Uh, <laughs> oh yeah, I even did the online portion of it, which was really fucking fun. It was like players versus like um, the computer where it was really hard waves and you had to survive and then you would get your galactic readiness score up to 100 to get the perfect ending, which is what I did. Um, I loved Mass Effect, but I will say <laughs> when it first came out, the, the first game, it was incredible and unlike any other game I'd played, but it didn't really hold up to time. Because <laughs> I remember no, when doesn't. Mass Effect 2 came out, I was like, oh, I'm going to go back, start a new character so I can you know, have, have this alternate... Uh, character go all the way through Mass Effect 2 and when I went back to play the first game it just it was so clunky and I, I couldn't get through it again sounds oh, like uh, oh what's up I was gonna say that there are a lot of games there are very few games that I feel like they they absolutely hold up as new generations of technology come out but that's fine right like a game doesn't have to hold up forever For and sure. I think there's a little bit of especially like Sure, Mass Effect is pretty open world, but it's still 
there is a story. There is a set start and a set end, and sure, there may be a couple of different endings, but once you've seen all of them, there's nothing new to experience. So uh, it, it's it yeah. may not it may not be that it's not holding up to the test of time. It may just be you've done everything. It doesn't have infinite replayability. It's not a roguelike where it's meant to allow you to just play it forever. However, let's focus on how Mass Effect gets its story across and the, also the player experience while going through that. It's a linear game for the most part. However, Zara, you mentioned as an open world as well. This makes me think also of like KOTOR. That's, a, I think, another good example. Of, it may feel a little open world, but for the most part, it is also... Uh, and I'm speaking of Knights of the Old Republic. It's definitely you know, a dated game at this point. Um, <laughs> oh, my God. That, yeah. one, that one I did get the chance to go through. Very linear, I will say. It's very easy to just kind of walk a straight line and get to the ending uh, with it. Now, with open world... Oh, my God. I might not have experience with this one, but I think a really good example, and I, I want to actually say this one sits as a sandbox open world, thanks to all the gadgets that are available to you, but Breath of the Wild. Yeah, I was thinking the same thing. If not Breath of the Wild, then I don't remember what the newest one is called, but the one where you actually ha can build machines and whatnot. In Tears it. of the Kingdom. Tears of the, Thank Tears you. Of the Kingdom, yeah. Yep. yeah it's on, it's yeah. on my list. I just have not had time to play it yet. I'd say that's probably a oh, perfect man. example of one of those open world approaches to how the story comes across. In specific, one thing that I want to point out with it is the approach to the final boss, uh, Ganon. I'm sure there's nothing to worry about spoilers at this point in the game's lifespan. It's a Zelda but, game. The, yeah. the spoilers. enemy is always Ganon. <laughs> yeah, seriously. <laughs> what? However, I didn't you know can that. go straight no, to him. Oh, you can go straight to him, which is going to be exponentially harder. Versus if you were to go to each one of the towers, each one of the other locations that will weaken him before you go to fight him. And that's where the exploration comes into play. Mm -hmm. You can oh, just yeah, hit him yeah. with a stick. Could, yeah, I, I think him right in the I'm not sure I would consider Mass Effect truly an open world in the same way that I wouldn't consider a game like Doom open world, even though there's branching paths. You're sort of that sort of blurs the line between what is open world and what is non-linear storytelling like i mass effect from the pieces of it that i've watched seen like i said haven't played all of it or i haven't played it but it's not a game where you know you're it, you have these massive swaths of open world that are persistently loaded right so you you still have sort of defined go here go here go here go here as opposed to a game where parts that are not applicable to the story you can just go back to an existent hmm. so yeah. you it, it's, yeah. it's the difference between the separating linear versus non-linear storytelling and what separates a, a non-linear story from something like breath of the wild that is truly open world where you could just go find all the koroks there's no story component to that at all <laughs> you could just run around and go find them and they exist in the world yeah but yeah, if if it. anything where oh if we if you sort of draw the line at anything can be open world as long as you don't it's not a truly linear story or if it's got branching paths or whatnot then technically every visual novel is open world and that's just not true. It's true. It's like Mass Effect is definitely more like an RPG than like open world. I would say it it has the illusion of being an open world where like there are these things you can go to, but there is a story and there's a progression, right? Yeah. Different than um, I would say like, uh, oh my god, I'm like blank. <laughs> like Elden Ring is a good example though of a good open world game that is like non-linear storytelling because you could go yeah. wherever the fuck you want. <laughs> and still I mean, get the story, story enough to well i think there's, there's storytelling come on there's are you saying there's not story. war there, yeah You're the war isn't necessarily likes the lore. yeah you want storytelling <laughs> in elden ring it's all it's dying a hundred times um, to get three lines of text from the item it drops <laughs> <laughs> yeah but my person is you know has their own story well it's user created story in a lot of ways right it's like what is your character doing do you want to play with friends you're making your own story not in not for not for this episode, but we need to do an episode <laughs> at some point on player generated content, which is oh, a whole is a other can of worms. Well, hold that. Oh, that's up. cool. Yeah, so, I didn't even think of it. Out of curiosity, I don't, I don't know if we actually got this answer already, uh, but for both Zeru and Pat, what what side do you lean on? Do you prefer more linear type 
uh, storytelling with your games, or do you prefer being able to just go wherever you want and determine that ending for yourself, uh, these open worlds? Um, I, I'm actually, I'm kind of in the middle, but with a slight lean towards Ooh. linear. Um, mm. Like, I, I guess, I, I don't know if the term Metroidvania is still used these days to describe a game genre. It's like kind yes, of... it is. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah, so I, I guess kind of the you know, like the Dark Souls series could be kind of considered that because it's not open world, but you do unlock areas of the map until you have access to the whole thing. And it's not really linear. Um, And and I really like that style. Um, And I think that's one of the reasons um, Sekiro is actually my favorite From Software game because uh, instead of creating your own character, which I do love doing that, but... In Sekiro, like you play as Sekiro, and you kind of get deeper connections with the characters, and you, by the end of the game, you really feel like you've mastered the play style of this one character. Um, whereas, like games like Elden Ring, it's that's incredible in its own way because you can really branch off and do so many different types of things mm-hmm. uh, in terms of like just the play style alone. Oh, I always forget about Sekiro. But yeah, like you, you play as a character who has like his own kind of thing going on. It's like easier to kind of jump into that than making somebody who you're not sure ha- what their connection to the world is. Mm-hmm. Yeah, That's I'm very, game. I'm pretty much with <laughs> Pat with one notable exception of I love, I love linear storytelling. I love like if you have a story, tell it. And if you don't have a story, don't spend the time masquerading as if you do. Mm, that's a great way of putting Ooh. it, yeah. The only exception I will make is my favorite game ever, which is, has no storytelling, but is as true an open world game as you can get, and that's The Witness, which is an open world puzzle game. Oh, oh I've heard so much about this one. I know, I never actually played it, though. I, The Witness, you start off, you start off knowing nothing. There is... There's these audio logs that you can find across it that will give you some semblance of story, but the story isn't ever 100% clear of huh. why it exists. The story is more a, more just a philosophical set of things to get you thinking that are not some eye-opening truth of the universe. They're just fun and interesting. But you can do... You have to do the first two puzzles, once you do the first two puzzles, any puzzle you do after that, you get to pick what order you do them in. So oh, there, are, cool. and you, I think it's like the eighth or ninth puzzle you find, you do not know how to solve. Like the eighth or ninth one, you will come across, you will not know how to solve on your first, the first time you see it. But as you just walk around the world, you will find out about how the puzzles work. And that's sort of my favorite part of it is you don't, it, not knowing how a puzzle works you 100% of the time means that you have missed some sort of tutorial naturally existing elsewhere in the world for you to learn how it works there's none of this like we have to break away and separate the world and say here's a tutorial of you click this button you click that button it's like no you need to dub wasd to move mouse to look and left click that's all you need for the entire game (laughs) that's really cool yeah that actually kind of reminds me of um outer wilds has anyone played that i have gotten some time into it i've actually never completed it due to some unfortunate unfortunate circumstances that is such an amazing game i've only gotten yeah. to explore it for about four hours or so I've, yeah. i'm too busy or just running everywhere trying to see all the interactions yeah i know it's, it's like so that crazy. if you want an open world game that is that that's an open universe game mm-hmm. <laughs> um uh, and, it, and it's cool because it has similar puzzle elements that you were talking about, Zero, where, like, if you, like, it's all there, you, you, everything's accessible from the start, but it's, you're, you're only locked out of content by what knowledge you have. Um, and it's one of those games, like, there's, like, a repeating cycle, so you, it, it's kind of like a, it's sort of like a roguelite in a way, so you get, get to, like, try over and over again. And, like, once you gain certain knowledge, you're able to, you know, do, like, solve the puzzles faster because there's only, like, a certain time limit per cycle. That's super cool. I'll have to, I'll have to look into that. The, yeah. um, the Witness, you can actually complete the game multiple times without solving every single puzzle. 
Um, because there are a, there are multiple different endings, and sort of the first ending you come across, you don't need to solve every puzzle to beat. Which is very interesting for a puzzle game that you don't need all of them. Yeah, um, that's interesting. Hmm. But it's got everything. It's got a time trial, sort of as the final boss. What? Uh, yeah, it's got a time trial as the final well, boss. I'm gonna great. check this out. It's so. such a fun game. You should play it on stream sometime. It's oh crazy interesting. Let me I'm, throw I'm a notoriously out. good at puzzle solving. Sorry, anyway. <laughs> oh, I was going to say, let me throw a classic out with this as well. Uh, let's bring in Zelda Ocarina of Time. Let's bring in Super Mario 64, and I'll throw in my favorite, uh, Banjo-Kazooie. Oh, yes. <laughs> Such a good game. I wouldn't say necessarily linear, though the world progression does push in that direction. But within each one, you are able to fully explore. And you can, for Ocarina or even Majora, we can just say it's the zones, which are basically their own little worlds in each interaction. I would, I would actually push and say there's... Super Mario 64 and Ocarina are about as close as you could have gotten at the time to an open world. It was before we had really perfected pre -lo or lazy loading of entire levels it feels to me especially for a game like super mario 64 the only reason that there are levels at all and that they can't just exist all as one being is because you need different environments to some of them need different environments and because the technology simply was not there mm -hmm. but i would say for the time those are about as close to an open world game as you can get yeah definitely Mm -hmm. yeah it's i, I think that way. yeah it, and it, it kind of i guess that goes back to like the metroidvania style where there are all these connected zones that you know you're, you're only like locked out by like certain like items that you have to get in the game but then once you obtain those you have access to the whole world mm -hmm. we've seen a lot of rpgs that have been coming out a lot more recently too it each one has brought old mechanics each one has improved on old things each one has improved on things that other competitors have brought forth uh really like 200 plus years we have gone pretty far with how we are looking to do stuff with this as well as we've been introduced to a number of different ways that we as players grow within the story that's happening unfolding before us or even our characters uh, one thing from stories, you usually earn your power-ups or your upgrades in some pivotal interaction or crucial interaction that you get that's fed to you via the story, and there is a canonical reason of why you can now do X, Y, Z. Uh, versus like with open world, I'll lean back on Oper Ocarina of no, Ocarina Time. Well, yeah, we can. We can, lean, we can lean back on Ocarina of Time, but I was trying to mention Breath of the Wild. What you mm -hmm. find is based on what towers you visit, what drops you get for the little you know, the little switch you got inside the game oh my god that game uh, can, I just say, so, can i be honest you can do so many interesting things with like i've seen speedrunners absolutely destroy some of those uh mm -hmm. some of the shrines where you you load in and you proceed to break the physics as much as you possibly want and say screw the puzzle you gave me i'm doing it this way well that's the speedrunner oh. your approach can always change depending <laughs> on knowledge of oh no, no what, I, you, uh, what was mentioned about outer wilds Exactly. It's just I would I would constitute what speedrunners are doing as sort of the ultimate version of they have knowledge of how the internals of the game work, regardless of how the mechanics were intended to be used. They mm. understand them on a completely different level. Breath of the Wild really annoyed me in terms of story. The story felt like it was like the worst story I've ever read. I'm sorry, I have to say it. We all know Ganon and everything, but they it the story felt like it didn't matter at all the real thing was the exploration and the you know building i think building and using your powers in an interesting way that was it that was what the game wanted to be and me who enjoys a good story and cool temples and all that stuff i was really mad about breath of the wild don't hate me please that's a hot take uh, yeah, it, I mean, I, I have to agree with you. Actually, despises Breath of the Wild. I That's hate it. She's, she's I, holding I back right game. now. She's holding back. Right now. I have so I could but I could write a book report about. I, it, but... to be honest, I, I, I had fun. Like I, I played through the whole thing and I beat it, and I enjoyed it. But I do agree with a lot of what Falco said. 
Um, for me, one of the biggest issues was uh, right at the beginning of the game, uh, an NPC basically monologues and reveals a lot of the lore to you. And I think a lot of that stuff could have been found out through the exploration. Um, and yeah. so it, it kind of like deflated some of the mystery of the world. And I, I didn't like, like I would have been more excited to explore the world if I didn't know everything from the beginning. The you mean you don't love knowing? Dump. Yeah. Oh God, the big cut scene that would go on forever. And then that was the only thing they'd ever say ever. And it was just like, yeah, we know you don't care about this, okay? Yeah. Um, and you know. also in Breath of the Wild, <laughs> hold on, I just have to get this out, I swear, I'm you almost done. <laughs> um, the items that you get don't really matter either, because it's not about getting stuff, because there's no real progression in that game. It's just about what can you build, what can you utilize that you have in order to make something that will fit the situation. Because um, items die, like they break. So getting a new item isn't really like it punishes you almost for using new things for experimenting. You don't want to track your, your hunger, your thirst. You don't want to track the durability <laughs> of your weapons. You know, you'd be oh, throwing them everywhere. It. I hate it. There's no other way to progress in that game other than having things that break. So it makes sense how they did it, but it does make me mad because it means that cool sword that I have. What if I accidentally swing it against like something by accident? Oh no, now it's got like less durability. You can't even track it either. Oh my God, don't even. Okay, Maybe anyway. you shouldn't be running around with your strongest sword in your main hand. <laughs> oh my God, but I want to use it. I spent a lot of time to okay, get it. Okay, then it's going to break. Oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> that is something that's uncommon with open world games, however, on whether or not there are survival or durability to some of the things that you have. I wouldn't say that's uncommon. Most games have I'd that. I'd say it became well, common for a little bit, but for the most part, it was uncommon. It kind of depends what the game is, right? Like mm -hmm. survival games, yeah, there's going to be like a lot of durability and things like that. But uh, story-based games don't have a lot of that. Like maybe you have to repair your items sometimes, but it's not going to actually break on you forever. True, like, but that's, like a way. True, but that's because what they're... Yeah, that's true because no. they're they're trying to tell a story. They're not trying to make you survive. I think it comes back to what is the game trying to accomplish? And if you have a story, use your mechanics to tell that story. Don't use it surrounding us with frivolous BS. It's true. And you can, like, like in um, Tears of the Kingdom, you're able to actually, like, craft crazy items by, like, you could, like, put a rock on a stick and that's, like, an item. I like, like I mean, making the most ridiculous combinations possible. I've seen people make full-on planes in that game. Nothing yeah, surprises like me anymore. Yeah, like real robotics and cars and like insanity and like really. So it's like really like it's it's an open world, but within it, it is a sandbox because you can manipulate the world through like existing in it <laughs> and by just taking what's in the world and like bending it to your will. You're not going to like destroy a tower or like environment like you can in um, a game. Like have you guys ever played Just Cause, that yes. series? I have okay, not. Yeah, I've you, watched. <laughs> It's so chaotic. I feel like it's up your alley. Uh, <laughs> um, just you, you could like destroy stuff. You could like fly on things and make crazy contraptions and blow things up. And that, oh my god, I, it's just, I like, would, there's so many choices for people. I play. would say Just Cause really, really teeters that fine line between just true open world and sandbox, though. Yeah, it does. It really does. Oh my god, now I'm thinking about how ridiculous that the game is. Um, <laughs> What were you yeah, we talking so, about? <laughs> well, yeah, no, I, I would say, um, in, in my opinion, for those reasons, Breath of the Wild, I think, is an incredible sandbox game. Like, I, I don't, like, whatever the developers, like, the engineers they have for that game are, like, geniuses for figuring out all that physics-based stuff and just, like, creating this really robust system of being able to craft, like, vehicles and weapons and all this stuff and like your other special abilities that you get as well and it's just it's a really cool sandbox game uh but for me i think it it, it falls flat in terms of like an open world like story based game like, i i you know i i grew up uh with ocarina of time being my first zelda and my favorite one 
Um, and I know a lot of people have that opinion as well. Um, and Same with Breath of the Wild and Tears of the Kingdom just... I didn't... I, I was disappointed with the story and the the world itself... There was a lot of cool stuff in it. I, I'm trying not to like like crap on it too much because I really did enjoy <laughs> the games. But oh my God, I think Zelda overall I'm disappointed. Anyway, sorry, I can, I'm done. I can completely agree with you on that. Like I I had not played a Zelda game in a long time before Breath of the Wild. And then to have that immediately followed up with uh, Link's Awakening. Link's Awakening is a completely different approach to storytelling. And I oh, think yeah. it pulls off the storytelling part much better. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Hmm. Out of curiosity, between the shift of previous Zelda games and then to this open world format, do you feel that you enjoy being able to find your power ups or find your equipment versus earning it via? Well, I mean, you're going to earn it as well in like the open world stuff, but via earning it through story means? Open world games are hard to do right. They are hard to make them feel substantially full without feeling overcrowded and at the same time hard to make the things that you progress for feel worth it. I feel like Breath of the Wild did about as good a job as it could of trying to connect the sort of where the story takes you to these different, you know, challenges and checkpoints to defeat each of the Guardians to get um, to get the different powers. But I actually, for a game like that where you're supposed to have access to more things, where you can, you're no longer asking yourself, hey, am I unable to complete this puzzle because I'm doing it wrong or because I'm missing, you know, some sort of key mechanic that I haven't unlocked yet. So in Link's, in Link's Awakening, if there's a long gap that you can't cross, you learn pretty early on, oh, I, uh, if I see one of these, I got to come back to it later. Because I just don't have the power to do it right, as opposed to in Breath of the Wild, you're sitting there saying, "Am I missing one of the powers, or am I just bad?" It's <laughs> a good point. That's yeah. a pretty good point. That's what I ask myself every time. <laughs> Was this bad. issue amplified in Breath of the Wild? Uh I think Breath of the Wild. It it's it's slightly apparent in Breath of the Wild in some of the shrines. Where you look at some of the trines and it's like, oh, I uh, I need the ability to freeze and I don't have that yet. Hmm. Um, or, you know, I need I need the square and the sphere, the cube and the sphere bomb both so I can, you know, chain them off of each other kind of thing, but I don't have them yet. Uh, as opposed to Link's Awakening where there is rock, I don't have bomb, must come back when I have bomb. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Ocarina of Time's like that too, actually. Yeah, there's a lot of like things where you're like, "Oh, I need, I need something. I can't get in there." All right, time to come back later. It seems like um, it's more of a thing with backtracking. I know that's like yeah. a recent thing that I ended up noticing in the God of War Ragnarok is backtracking oh. is a huge thing. Uh, Black Myth Wukong. I don't really want to stay on that topic for too much, but Black Myth, oh. Black Myth Wukong is notorious for backtracking. Oh, you don't have to tell me twice. Do you Holy see shit. backtracking as so a much. problem? No, 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 no. I personally don't see it as a problem if there is purpose in it. However, I do find a lot of things arbitrary uh, other than just a story. Uh, I'm a cutscene skipper. If In open game, oh, open world no. games, I normally skip all the cutscenes oh, unless it's God. like Elden Ring cutscenes. I normally no. do not care because majority of the story is fed to me via text and I don't read. <laughs> <laughs> i can't believe this you've heard it here folks he doesn't read i don't read all right wait you I, can't read or you don't I, read no, i don't read <laughs> i'm the kind of person who in the elder scrolls 3 i would like read all the books <laughs> oh i God. i don't do that anymore i i can't be bothered but like i was obsessive when i was younger <laughs> back in the day i think the one oh game that God. got me to read a ton was divinity original sin 2 because oh. I did the same thing in that game. I read every book. I I was so enamored by that game. It's very few games that have pushed me, at least to that point, where I cared about reading every piece, uh, every piece, piece of literature and dialogue. <laughs> I, I cannot speak. Yeah, you me know, either. In terms <laughs> of getting lore from the world, um, 
bringing it all the way back to Mass Effect, uh, I thought it was interesting for such a linear game. Um, they gave you a lot of opportunities to talk with random NPCs and you can have like really deep conversations and like you get, you can get all this lore about like the different alien races and their like home worlds and you know, different like factions and organizations in the, in the universe. And I thought that was a pretty interesting way of, um, kind of the, the world building, uh, Mm -hmm. And it kind of like like it made me desire like a more of an open world style for that game, but it's like like you go to like the main areas of the story, and I, I think Zero mentioned this early on. Um, you know, like if it's not relevant to the story, you can't go to like that part of the city, and that was kind of a bummer. But um, it, it's it's some, there's something to say about it that being like a really strong uh, method of providing lore because it made me want more of the game understandable that's a good point and you can date Gareth Vakarian so oh, I mean, I mean that's the best part of that game uh, <laughs> <laughs> but you know what like this is actually really reminding me back of like in the days of Skyrim and um, who made Skyrim was it it was Bethesda right yeah 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 like any game that they put out like I would never finish it because the game was too big. There was too many side things to do. Actually, I'm notorious for this in general with open world games. I will be like, oh, there's a main story. But what's that over there? What's that over there? Oh, I want to be the head of this guild. Oh, I want to do this. And then by the time I'm done doing all of that, I forgot what the main story was. And I'll just put it down. I've noticed I do this all the time. I'm really bad. Yeah, that's ultimately and- <laughs> why I end up skipping everything. Oh my god. Yeah. yeah. If the game has good mechanics, usually that'll carry me through it, but I tend to enjoy open world games only to get immersed in the world, but in most cases, I kind of don't care. I'm not there to form a connection with my character. I'm there to just experience sightseeing everything and then fight cool stuff if there's a combat. Uh, otherwise, like I tend traveler. to not even play it. Wow, that's crazy. Yeah. I mean, it, it is actually insane how much content is in these open world games. Like, I, I'm That's so impressed. Thing. Yeah. One million it, it, there's side so many quests. quests. Yeah, like The Witcher 3, another good example. Another game I didn't f- finish <laughs> where I, I just wanted to go to everything on the map before doing the main quest, and then I forgot what the main quest was, as usual. Yeah. Uh, so it's, <laughs> it's, I was like way over leveled at the end there. I was like, Oh, wait, I wasn't supposed to swim to the island and fight the hard things first? Yeah, I'm But that was fun. <laughs> <laughs> so much fun. Oh, man. But in that game, it was like, um, there's a lot of just player expression because you, you could just make cool builds and things like that. So it just felt like you could, it was fun to experiment and like not progress the story and see how, like, can I kill the things that are way above my level? So that's definitely a different thing with open world games where you have a level or some sort of progression. Not all yeah. of them as Breath of the Wild, but um, it really say, does make you feel powerful. Anyway. When there's yeah. too much <laughs> stuff in the game, everything is a distraction. And that's actually a pet peeve of mine too. Uh, yeah, opening the map and not being able to actually see the map because there's a million and one icons up there. That drives me insane. Oh my God. The yeah, one thing out of can, all that can become a big issue. Oh, Oh, one hundred percent. I'm a I'm a side quest I'm a side quest king. I usually <laughs> like clearing out the zones. And one thing that'll get me to put a game down and never touch it again is when I clear out a zone, I go continue a little bit, and all of a sudden I see new quests show up in that zone, and I'm like, oh. all right, I'm not <laughs> oh, doing no. that. We're not How do you handle MMOs then? I don't. I just ignore. <laughs> oh, okay. Got it. You just ignore stuff. <laughs> Once again, you think All I'm right. there to form a connection with my character? No, I'm there to keep <laughs> people alive and press my glowy buttons. That's really funny. That's that's funny because if you are more of a, a story-oriented person who's trying to make a connection with your character, it is kind of funny in an open world game when there's a ton of side quests because it's like, you know, you're the witcher and it's like, oh, there's like trouble afoot. I have to stop the big bad guy. But let me go help out this old lady, like, f- find her frying pan. Yeah, you're one of the best parts. I, I have time for that. <laughs> I'm yeah. skipping Grand Nam's request, too. I just grab the quest paper, and I go, I know not why I'm oh here, but I must God. quest. 
you're just you're just picking up stuff. You're like fuck, and then you keep going. Yeah, you just have yeah. no idea why or where, but you <laughs> you know it must be done. Oh, one hundred percent. Open world games. It's harder for me to get into a story side of it until I've beaten the game at least once. Versus story, uh, like linear story games. I'm there for the ride. I'm there to watch everything. You know, it's yeah. it's the same with me. Actually, like talking about this really makes me realize because like GTA, like possibly one of the biggest open world games there is, uh, especially like the new one. I I remember really playing that, thinking it was really cool, and then immediately losing interest just because it was too big, too much to do. I could I could play tennis for an hour if I want. Like, there's just too many choices. Like I can't live my life that way. I think for me, I need I need like more on rails experience because I only have so much time to devote to like the character and the story. But I want to give it a good chance. You know what I mean? Oh God, I, so many games I haven't finished are open world. Now I'm thinking about it. The shelf just gets more littered, doesn't it? <laughs> you know. Mm -hmm. Oh, what's up? No, yeah, it's just making me think. Um, because th there's. I guess technically there's two types of open worlds if you think about it. There's one where you you have like a main character like the Witcher and then there's the type where you create your own character. Um so like like the Witcher and like GTA it's like you're playing these specific characters that have their own story. And I find that I I tend to kind of skip some of the side quests if I have a character that I'm playing as Whereas Elder Scrolls and that type of open world, I, since my character is just like this cool guy that I created, I tend to explore more and just kind of like immerse myself in the world. And I didn't really realize that until we were talking about this just now. So that's mm. kind of interesting how the character affects how I play. That is really cool, actually. And like, there, you got I don't know. Oh, yeah, yeah. Mm, not so much one way or the other. I think Pat kind of hit the nail on the head, at least a little bit for me, of... Yeah, no, nothing really to add. I think Pat covered it all. Pat, you did it. I'm too good. Yeah, that's on <laughs> it. Pat and I think very alike. That is true. We, we do have the same name after all. Yep. One <laughs> genre versus the other is more prone to what I'm about to bring up accidentally missing um, a cutscene or an interaction due to time sensitivity or due to a specific uh, specific sequence that things have to be completed. Like you must have gone to zone B before you actually went to zone F and then so on and so forth to then go back to zone A. And if you didn't do that, you don't get this certain item because you're just going to complete the quest normal instead of completing it oh, via my this means. That is one of my biggest pet peeves. My biggest pet peeve, even it. more than that, is when games decide they're going to have the brilliant idea of tying events to real world time. Oh where it's God. like, it's like, hey, this thing's only available at 4 p.m. on a Tuesday. It's like, well, I have work, so um, <laughs> I can never do that. Twitch drops. <laughs> God. It's, it's so true. That's a really good point. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, Actually, I, I just experienced this, Sin, you know about this, in Wukong. I, I had no idea, first of all, that I had to do all this crazy minutia in order to trigger a cutscene in the first place. So I go do it, only because I was told, not because the game gave any um, hint or whisper that I should do this. And I try to use this item that's supposed to make me like a fox or whatever, and... I walk into the, uh, the room where this boss is that I'm supposed to use this item on. I use the item, but I'm already in the room. And then I get attacked by the boss. I was told, however, that a cutscene, I missed a cutscene because I didn't do, I didn't use the fox form far enough out of the room. Yep. So I went through that work. I was so angry because shouldn't the cutscene just fucking play? Like I did, I'm in the thing. I was so mad. And now yeah. I missed out on like a cool thing that could have helped me understand more like why I even got that thing. You know what's And funny? I miss it. Just <laughs> Is that in the context of that character, it makes sense why he attacked you because he saw you transform into the fox. It, it actually you know canonically and to his lore makes sense why. 
His and back it was makes turned. A, that's fine. <laughs> if you if you end up getting the cutscene from walking from the outside, it also makes sense why he reacts to you the way he does when you specifically walk in as the fox form versus transforming right next to him because he has a reaction when you transform out of the fox form. Oh my god, I hate yeah. this so much. However, this makes it even that's more beside mad. The point. <laughs> With this issue, I tend to find this more this this accidentally missing something, time sensitivity, so on and so forth. I tend to find this issue more when the games are more lax with your exploration. Uh, I will throw Black Myth Wukong out there. It's a perfect example. Uh, God of War has the same, uh, same uh, issue as well. There have been a couple other things that also have these kind of time gates, and it's usually games that do allow you to explore a little bit more uh, if there's side quests involved. Yeah, I don't see this as often with true, like, straight linear games you're meant to just get through the game i think the last game i've had that actually put me on guardrails like this and just made me walk a straight line was probably the order 1886 oh my god that game that, that game was, was really cool beauty it was pretty cool yeah oh man yeah, yeah at, what point, point, at what point does it stop being <laughs> an open world game and become a walking simulator exactly you're there for the roller coaster at that point it's a lot of yeah, that. Yeah, like the beginner's guide. Yeah. I, Pat and Failco, um, I'm, I'm sure Pat and Failco have played, I, have played the beginner's guide. Yeah, I remember guide, that but... game, yeah. <laughs> Are you talking about, oh, no, 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 I'm thinking of something else. I don't no, we're playing it. Hitchhikers. No, 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 Jonathan Blows, the beginner's guide. Basically, anyone who's gotten into developing games with the games industry has played that game at some point. It's... Yeah, it's a game where you're like walking and the narrator's talking to you and the narrator will tell you like the character does this, like turns <laughs> left down this thing. And it's, then sometimes you go the other way and then it's like the character doesn't <laughs> listen to directions and it's really fucking funny. Yeah, oh, it's uh, like <laughs> it's, no no, it's yes, like Stan it's, it's like, like Stanley Parable. Or parable but yeah, yeah, it's parable. just like it's that, like Stanley yeah. Parable, but it's the narrator is more of an unhinged game developer talking about all the problems that lead to developer burnout. That's really what it comes down to is they're talking about how does this, how does, you know, you design all this cool stuff. You design this path. The player is supposed to turn right. And then the player turns left and none of that matters anymore. And you're sitting here questioning your life about why you spent six weeks building it in the first place. It's so funny. Yeah. And, and that's Such made even worse unhinged. in open world games because – like, you could potentially never see, like, an entire area that's hidden, <laughs> you know? Yeah. <laughs> so and it could, crazy. and a lot of the times, it could not be your fault either. Yeah, yeah. It could not be your fault. It could it's not be the developer's fault. fault. It could, no, well, it's it's usually your fault. It can never be Pat's no! fault. <laughs> um, I think but, that is one of those heartbreaking things, too. Do you, as a player... Feel bad when you find out you missed something crazy on your initial playthrough, or are you content with your completion? Depends on how crazy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, like a actually, depends on how crazy. If it if it's like game changing, like I missed a power up that could have completely changed that I think would have been really cool, would have changed the way that I personally would have played the game. And I find out that I missed that on my first playthrough. No way. Am I playing the game a whole second time to get that? And I'm just going to be sad the entire rest of the day. What if the oh discovery God. of that item <laughs> was elaborate? What if it was complex to the point where you can look back and go, you know what? I, it makes sense why I didn't find this. Well, then I'm just angry. Then I'm not sad. Then I'm angry. <laughs> How could they hide such a thing from me? Well, how exactly. dare they make the completion of this so difficult without a guy? Why, why'd they give me all of this crap that I don't want to use and hide the one thing I desperately want behind an arbitrarily difficult set of restrictions that no one was ever going to figure out without a guide? So true. I think if it's done really well, it, it can be cool. Because hmm. then you feel really smart if you figured it out. <laughs> Yeah, but you got to give enough information in game to know yeah. that something's there, right? Like if I see something and it's like a branching path, and I'm like, I'll come back this some other time, and then I forget about it, and I find out that it was something really cool. I'll say, all right, I'll go back and figure it out. But if I never know it's there, and the only time you find it out is like for Failco, the only time she'll find out something like that is through is through stream chat, where she's like, wait, I missed what? 
It's literally the only way I can play some games. There's yeah, exactly. no other way like, sometimes. <laughs> though, that is just, that's bad design, in my opinion. See? Speaking See? of finding secrets and all that, <laughs> this has been a trending topic in, like, it goes on and off throughout the years. And as new games, primarily any of these story-driven games, these RPGs, the use of yellow paint to guide the way. Because <laughs> otherwise, how is the player ever going to know where they're going? Don't need this yellow is paint, an issue for do both. Need, you don't need I yellow paint, yellow but paint. your affordances <laughs> need to actually be there. The problem is, that, all right, so context for anyone who is listening to this and not in game design. Pat, do you want to give the definition of an affordance? Do you know what those are? Have you or Failco ever come across the term affordance and signifier in your game design travels? Um, not specifically, so go for it. <laughs> okay, in a... <laughs> An affordance is an affordance is something that you can do. It is a button. It is a lever. It is something you can interact with that you can perceive and interact with that will open up a path, right? It could be the yellow paint. It could be, oh, we're walking down this path, and for whatever reason, as we're walking down, there's this suspicious path of rose bushes that is not on the path I'm taking, but kind of ominously sitting there that's an affordance it affords you the ability to do something a signifier is the sign that says go here it is the oh, sign that says this allows you to do something you don't need yellow paint if your affordances are good enough yellow I paint see. is a signifier that says follow this but if you have if you have affordances i'll come back to the witness when you finish a section in the witness it gives you a giant laser beam that points to the mountain that's a really good affordance that says there's something up there on the mountain. Go look at it. It doesn't need to tell you. It doesn't need to have this dialogue of, we should go look at the mountain. Or, here's a guiding path on the ground to get you to the mountain. It's like, no. Laser pointer pointed at the mountain. I should go that way. <laughs> right? Yeah. So, if you have good affordances, you don't need yellow paint. And if you need yellow paint, make better affordances. Yeah. It's definitely... Uh, I, I agree with that. And... I definitely think it can be difficult to have good affordances Um, because like God of War uh, Ragnarok, uh, that was a really cool game and like the graphics were so beautiful, but there were like some areas where, you know, there's like maybe a fallen tree or there's like a bush and you're like, but you can still see into the distance and you're like, Oh, it looks cool over there. I want to go over there. But apparently Kratos, you know, he can, kill gods and lift mountains but he can't hop over a, a little like <laughs> fallen tree branch so it's like <laughs> like, like <laughs> as players like we we get that it's blocking the path and you can't go that way but it if you're trying to be like as immersed as possible it does kind of like break that a little bit so i think yeah having good affordances is it, it takes a lot of creativity and um but yeah, yeah, it's definitely, I, I prefer that kind of method over the yellow paint. <laughs> a lot of what we've gone back and forth to really focuses on player choice. How much does player choice, how much do you value your availability your, to have impact, not necessarily in just your build, but with the world around you? And it, this may range from actually having multiple endings that are changed by your decisions along the way, or just in general, how you can approach different obstacles due to what you've gained through your journey. Hmm. I'm trying to think of really good examples here. I think something that comes to mind for me is literally like uh, Horizon Zero Dawn. Horizon Zero Dawn gives you like, I don't know if you guys have played that game, but you have all these cool weapons and you can choose to use them however you want really to better defeat like the giant dinosaurs. I mean, they are dinosaurs. Um, the robot and I always dinosaurs thought that and was... they're super freaking cool. Yeah. And like, so like you could take down like a flying one and it's kind of like, oh, I'm going to use this cool like item I have to like pin it to the ground and bring it close down to me. But I bet you could do it in other ways. But that um, that is a game that actually has a really, really good set of affordances. Weak spots 
on Ooh, enemies, yeah. like cleverly shown weak spots, be it, you know, you can see where the power cell is or. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Good game I mean, Doom, Doom uses it more as a signifier than an affordance, but Doom has the the famous help text. If it has a head, it's a weak point. It's like, great. <laughs> Good to know, because so then everything you, everything you see, you're looking for the head, right? And <laughs> that sort of guides choice. If you don't have to use it, but if you look at it, you'll recognize that as something you can do. That was maybe intended to be done. Would you say you value Damn. player your your player expression, the choices and the impacts that you can bring? Do you value that pretty highly? Uh, yeah. yeah, it depends on the game. If you want to tell me a story, don't give. I don't want any expression. I want to see the story you're trying to give me. If you're trying to give me this, if you're trying to build this all encompassing experience of I can live in the world and do whatever I want, then yeah, player expression matters. That's actually where I was going with this. With games, I'm going to use Kingdom Hearts 3 in a, as an example. Even though we knew ahead of time that it was going to be more story than outright gameplay, one of the biggest gripes was how many cutscenes there were versus how much time you would spend on average to play through the oh player God. available parts. Too many cutscenes. Way too many. <laughs> oh my God. Does that game have gameplay in it? Or is it just cutscenes? Because there were Did times I wasn't it? sure. Uh, yeah, I, I helped, <laughs> I helped my, uh, roommate years ago, um, beat the hard parts of the game, like some of the races and things that they couldn't do, but I sat there and watched the cutscenes and holy crap, just make it a movie at this point. <laughs> oh I my gosh. It. I was, I was, I was <laughs> one of the crazy folk on the, on the side of, uh, you know, I knew ahead of time that it was going to be predominantly cutscenes, and I enjoyed it for that fact. But that was a that was a but game that, that was there for the roller coaster. It is true though, like certain games, like you can forgive it because of the like the gameplay is actually fun when you get to play it. Like it is really fun. So I can see in that case being like you and maybe uh, skipping some cutscenes. Because will I still understand it anymore? No, I really don't. <laughs> uh. Actually, entirely, I entirely agree. I entirely agree. <laughs> With that game in particular, it's like, I'll just watch like a review afterwards that explains the story to me, you know? Uh. <laughs> that is exactly my approach to many other uh, many other titles. Kingdom Hearts, surprisingly, was a game I did not skip cutscenes. That's wild. But yeah, hey, it's you know so what? funny considering every other game <laughs> that I play, I just skip everything. <laughs> you, just, you just love the anime stuff. It's okay. We get it. Maybe. We get it. Or I just hit something <laughs> 27 times with my staff. That's actually an achievement. Oh, my gosh. Get that. <laughs> oh, that's a lot. I'll get good one day, I swear. <laughs> sure. So you would <laughs> rather never be stuck in cutscene uh, purgatory. Oh, my God. Let me skip, skip the cutscene. I'll watch it once. But if you're going to chain them together and it's going to be like 10 minutes, like I, I don't have that much patience. Like <laughs> God of War is pushing it for me because like there's a lot of cutscenes in that game too, but mostly like they're just sequences. They, they're they pretty good about it. They keep like the characters talk while you're moving a lot of the time and you get a lot of your story that way. But when there's a cutscene, a lot happens and they there's keep also it like... like quick time events in there too. Oh yeah. Quick time event. They keep you engaged. I think I prefer that over just straight up like here's a movie out of curiosity since pat is normally the uh the operator and you're you're usually the spectator have you <laughs> has felco ever taken the control from you to forcefully skip a cutscene? uh no <laughs> okay okay do you uh do you mirror, mirror that as well where you'd rather not sit in cutscene purgatory no um i i like cutscenes. um i do think <laughs> If they're too long, I, I'm like, okay, when can I play again? Like, I, I was a big fan of the Metal Gear Solid games growing up. And, man, those had oh my God. some cutscenes. Um, they, they were also, like, <laughs> few and far between. Um, Me too. But, like, once you got to one, it was, like, very long. <laughs> um, so that, that's kind of pushing it for me. But I, I do like a good cutscene. <laughs> I'll watch him. What do you think about I'll watch him? I'll watch him. Um, I have to be like, it really depends on how engrossed I am with the story, right? Like, 
I've watched everything. They aren't long, and there aren't many of them, but I've watched all the Space Marine 2 cutscenes so far. I, I want to see the blueberries. <laughs> For the glory of the Emperor. I've heard good things about that For game. For the glory of the Emperor, I must watch the blueberries. <laughs> I've actually just recently <laughs> finished going through all the operations. Oh, it's so much fun. It I'm still, I'm only incredible. like... I'm only like three missions in. I don't have a ton of time to play it, but when I do get a chance to play it, boy, you must is it spend a fun some game. time throwing it back for the emperor, brother. Oh yeah. <laughs> well, I'm busy. I'm busy uh, throwing it back for Carl at the moment. <laughs> I saw you boot Who's that up. Carl? But all right, fair enough. Honestly, that's that's about everything that I had. Anything. Well, I know purpose, we covered a lot. I mean, this topic is so long. Like, it, it spans so many games. Like, Dead Rising is also a good one to talk about. Because uh, you could, like, you explore, like, the mall. You have a good story. But in your cutscenes, you have, like, whatever you're stupidly wearing. You could craft the your own Resident items. Resident Evil games. <laughs> a great Resident example of the, line, of the linear ones. Oh, yeah. There's, there's just so many examples. So mm -hmm. it's, like, maybe if there's a game that really, um, you know, grabs us at some point, we could do a deeper dive on that. Actually, something I haven't played is Cyberpunk. I've been thinking about finally giving it a try. Are you sure? That... I know, I know. Everyone tells me it's so good, though. It is so... really good. It it's is a really long good. They... Story game. It is a long yeah. story game that has a whole bunch of endings that you have to play a lot of the same stuff to get to over and over again. Ah, but it that's is the worst. the The DLC, the DLC is stunning. The DLC I've is a work is things. a true work of art. Um, well, thanks so much for listening. This has been Failure Incorporated. Um, uh, once again, here with Zero. Zero, you want to plug yourself real fast before you have to leave? Uh, at Zero98 everywhere. I have more announcements. Don't know when they're coming, but they will come at some point. Happy to be here. Pa yeah, awesome. Thank you, Zero. Pat, how about you? You want to plug anything that you're working on? or? Um, well, I'm on some freelance projects that I can't really talk about too much yet. Uh, but all my social media stuff is at potatogram. That's P A T A T O G R A M. Yeah, follow him on Instagram. He's an inspirational guy. You should totally do it. Just saying. And I'm here with obviously True Xen. Hello, everybody. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'll be your co host. You can catch me on Discord, just True Xen. Uh, catch me once uh, Marvel Rivals comes back out to see some funny throwing people off the map. Oh my god, can't wait. Yeah, December officially now editor enough. status too. However, comma. Yeah. Last but not least, our hostess. Oh, it's me. It's Failco Punch. And you can find me on all the social media things as a Failco Punch. So hope to catch you on Twitch sometime, where I'll totally be playing maybe The Witness at some point. Who knows? Anyway, thank you guys so much for listening, and we will catch you next time. Failco out.